Thank you very much, Simon. Oh, thanks for the introduction and, and thanks for your hospitality. Uh, it was lovely to be invited to come to Sydney, all the way from Canberra, a lot closer than California. So, um, yeah, and so um, so this paper is joint with um, my graduate student, one of my graduate students, uh, Brad. Um, and Brad used to work for one of these list vendors uh, in the United States and, um, and knows an awful lot about the sort of data and their, uh, that these companies have and, and the uses to which those data are put. I, I couldn't have hoped for a, for a better co-author uh, on, on, on this project. So for the uninitiated, let me just um, say a little bit about what these lists are, the title of the paper, Unlisted, that presumes they're listed, and so what are these lists? Well, they're, they're really, they, they've come to occupy center stage in contemporary American politics. They are literally uh, computer databases that are, in the first instance, the voter rolls, as compiled first at the county level, then up to secretaries of state, and then um, a little bit of interesting history here, um, the parties sort of leapfrogging one another in their, uh, the amount of technology and resources they've thrown at building a national file. So you've got to remember, the United, this is not Australia, this is the United States, and it's, you know, it's a federal system, and, and um, election administration being one of the many things in the United States that is sort of, you know, uh, at, at, you know, run differently by different states and if not different counties. And so the idea that there's a national file of registered voters, you know, you grow up in Australia like I did and, and that's par for the course, that's just not the case in a country like the United States. And actually building one, no public entity has one. These are the, the national file, as it were, is a, is a creation, it's something that the, the parties uh, build for themselves. And, and Howard Dean, when he was chairman of the Democratic National Committee, through, you know, the, the, the Democrats at that point felt that they were very uh, outgunned by the Republicans in terms of data and technology and spent, you know, uh, uh, a truckload of money building a national database. Um, in turn, that effort inside the Democratic National Committee got spun off as a, as a standalone corporate entity called Catalyst that um, is uh, services uh, left of centre interest groups, uh, uh, you know, the union movement and, and various trade unions, um, um, so the left of centre groups are the, are the client base of this company now, uh, Catalyst. Um, um, in turn, to make the files more valuable, the lists have been augmented by consumer information. What I mean by that is, um, there is another set of companies out there. These are not political companies. These are uh, the companies that have a footprint here in Australia as well, by the way. Companies like Axiom, that's spelled A-C-X-I-O-M, um, Experian, uh, Info USA. These are the companies that collect our credit card data, frequent flyer memberships, uh, magazine subscriptions, the various ways that when you check the terms and conditions without reading them very carefully, um, that we're leaving digital fingerprints um, through our behavior as consumers, uh, essentially. Sometimes as property holders too, if you, if you own a home, uh, certainly in the United States this is the case, uh, and you show up on property tax records, that's another source of public information. Uh, you know, so this, this sort of field of, well, computer science, let's call it, but it, it's you know, data linkage, you know, linking data about you across multiple places. And anyway, so, so this is what these databases consist of. Uh, uh, so, and there are companies now that sell this data, again, Catalyst with a more left of center client base, the, the GOP Data Trust is the Republican, uh, currently the Republicans feel outgunned and are building their counterpart, the Catalyst, and then there are these, these other companies that are in the private sector, Target Smart and Labels and Lists, that will sell you uh, uh, data from the list or the entire list for a given location or, or whatever you want. You can license, have a license agreement with these companies so you can be pinging their data sets and, uh, and all the rest of it. Now the point is that these data sets are now at the heart 
of um, American politics. Right? These data are the grist of the mill of, of micro-targeting. Right? Um, um, this is how um, a piece of mail arrives at your house when you're a, a voter you know, in, in the United States. And, and moreover, they're linked up, you know, the campaigns use these data to sort of uh, keep track of early voters. Uh, we've also got your turnout history on that file as well. So we can see for a given individual, um, we can divine quite a fair bit of information, how long they've lived at the residence, uh, uh, the elections in which they've turned out in the past. So you can build quite uh, an interesting, useful, from a political perspective, profile of, of an individual from the data that, that, are, that, are in these, uh, that are in these files. And they've really come to occupy center stage in, in the big analytics uh, movement that's currently um, very, you know, kind of part of the folklore of the Obama campaign, frankly, was the use of, of data and analytics. Well, data like these, these lists were, lie at the heart um, of, of, of that, at least on the voter mobilization side. Okay. Um, moreover, the, is, we're not just talking about what's going on out there in the political industry, as it were. Political scientists themselves have availed themselves of, um, of, of these lists. Uh, they, they're the, uh, a source of subject pools, right? So the big turn to field experiments in American politics, both American political science and the practice of American politics, um, you know, began life with political scientists running experiments with subjects drawn from, from these lists. And the other use that these data are, are put to is that increasingly um, in the, this is more not inside the academy, but more out in campaign land, um, these lists are sampling frames. Uh, when you're going to run a, a, a poll for a campaign, wh who are the subjects? You know, what is the sampling universe? Well, you'll form your sample by randomly drawing names from these lists in a given location. So these lists have come to sort of, to, some, to no small measure, sort of define the electorate. And that leads sort of to, to the question where we said, well, who isn't on these lists? Um, and um, surely they don't have the entire uh, citizenry of the United States on them. Or if they did, that would be remarkable and a finding in and of itself, but, but that's not the case, as we'll see in a moment. Um, if these lists don't have universal coverage, then how big is the uncovered the unlisted population, and, and, and are they socially, politically, economically distinct? What are the consequences of American politics becoming this list-based, this list-driven, list-centric, uh, adopting a list-centric view of the electorate? Um, um, there are some sort of very practical implications of that as to, you know, uh, the way you run elections, of course, uh, or election campaigns, but there's also some real policy and normative consequences too. If these people are being systematically excluded in some way by the adoption of this technology that focuses on the listed, then you know, um, you know, who, who's not being represented or captured by uh, uh, this sort of mode of campaigning, this mode of electioneering that is so list centric. So that's what we're. That's the question that we're going to try and answer um, with this investigation. And the way we're going to do that is exploit the fact that um, I'm a principal investigator of, uh, one of the principal investigators of the American National Election Study, which has been um, in existence in one form or another since 1948. And so every four years, this study goes out using the same methodology that I'm giving, depending on what talk I'm giving, I'll, I poo-poo uh, the methodology as being hopelessly <coughs> old-fashioned and outmoded and hideously expensive and and you know, arcane and, and all the rest of it. But today I'm gonna to say it's fantastic because uh, what it is, it's boots on the ground. It is good old fashioned, uh, it uses a sampling design that goes back to you know, the 1940s and I guess the statistical work on this was done even earlier in the 20s and the 30s. How do you do a face-to-face -face sample with national coverage in the United States? Well, you can't do a random draw of households. Right, because that would mean, it'd be very inefficient. Right, you pull one household, you send an interviewer into one neighbourhood to interview one house, and then they have to drive half an hour to another place. So, the way statisticians figured out a long time ago, almost you know, 80, 90 years ago, how you solve that problem is to use something called the multi-stage cluster design, where you first sample locations or neighbourhoods, 
Um, and then within those, you then randomly sample houses, households, and, and then you um, go knock on doors. And so it's more efficient that way uh, in that uh, you, you, you're, at least you're making better use of your money uh, in the sense that, you know, while you've, got, you've randomly chosen a neighborhood, but while the field workers are in that neighborhood, they might try and do 20, 30 interviews uh, instead of just one and then have to drive an hour to the next randomly chosen address. So, so this is the way it's been done for an awful long time, and, and in this case we turn sort of what is a, a very old-fashioned and very expensive kind of clunky way of, of, of doing data. Oh, clunky's a little unfair. It's certainly expensive. That, that's certainly true. Uh, for putting human beings into the field to go knock on doors and try and conduct surveys, that's, that's a very expensive way of co collecting survey data. For our purposes today, though, it's got the great virtue, though, is that it gets us, it helps us cover uh, people that wouldn't be on these lists, right? We're not using the list as so much of the industry does. Right? We put the list to one side, we go implement this sampling design, and then um, we're able to in, um, see, you know, who we captured through this method that is sort of literally knocking on doors uh, in randomly selected households. Uh, compare what we, we discover when we enumerate households and, and talk to people versus uh, who, who's on the list. So, so a critical point is that the lists are not used in constructing our sample, and, you know, and that's a key to, to everything that follows. Um, ANES got uh, just over 2054, uh, or got 2054 um, completed pre-election interviews in, in 2012. And, and there it is, they're the, they're the census tracts in red, and the other little bits of like I guess other census tracts in the United States and sort of you just put down a, a little pixel of ink at each latitude and longitude point for a census tract in sort of the United States and the, the population centers sort of emerge kind of uh, organically as it were and our, our sample tracts are the, are, the, are the red dots. We had, we had people typically ones or twos um, of field workers in each of these, uh, every, every place you see a red dot when we tried to get about uh, 2,000 divided by 125 odd, um, you know, 14, 15 um, um, interviews in each uh, census tract. The census tract in the United States, just since I've mentioned, is about 3,000 households. And then after we collect it, right, so one of the things we do is we, um, uh, we ask people their names. Right? So we've got the address. Right. Um, we get the address from the United States, that's USPS CDSF, that's the United States Postal Service Cumulative Delivery Sequence File. So although the United States does not have a list of persons, uh, the Postal Service maintains a list of active addresses, which is, which is nice. Right. So now uh, we have a sample address that's in you know, post office approved quality, right? that's in good shape as addresses go. Um, for the most part. Um, 2006 respondents gave us a name that was something that wasn't just uh, I'm Jim or I'm JF or something like that. It actually gave us a name that we could use and we, we get a name because we actually pay people for their participation and so although one of the uses of the name is to allow us to look people up on voter files and these databases when we're done um, from, the, from the perspective of the respondents so we can write them a check to you know, thank them for their time. Um, this survey is 90 minutes long. The median time to complete is 90 minutes. And we, do it, we try and do it twice. We come back after the election as well. So, so incentives for taking the survey range from uh, anywhere from $25 on the low end up to $100 per city. So, um, yeah. okay. With the names, we then tried to match these people to some of those vendors I mentioned earlier. Uh, most of the matches we got come from Catalyst, but it took, we went back to these firms multiple times. Um, we, we did our absolute, our absolute best. We tried very hard to make sure we didn't call someone unmatched or unlisted who was in fact there. We, we went back to, the, to these databases multiple times. The other thing about the United States, it takes a company like Catalyst, one of these national vendors, takes them about a good eight months for the data from the 2012 election 
uh, to percolate up from the county level to the state level to finally a national vendor like Catalyst. It's not until the middle of 2013 that the state of the national voter roll, there is no such thing in the United States, but as constructed by this company, is sort of quite up to date, reflecting who voted or who didn't in the, in the 2012 election and registration statuses as of the uh, 2012 um, election. So this is a project that took quite a while. Just this matching was a repeated going back uh, to these companies. And, and we learned a lot about the pace at which um, they acquired data from, from, from the states and, and what have you. And on the basis of this matching exercise, we, 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 we broke our respondents, and in turn, to the extent they're representative of the population, into, into four, we break the population into four, four classes. There are people that we know who voted, right? There are, and they constitute 65%. So after we apply our sample weights, this is our estimate of the, of the breakdown in the US population, right? 65% of, uh, of cit this is a citizens as well. So non-citizens are excluded from the ANES sampling frame. And why we do that is a separate topic. But, but so this is with respect to the citizen population. 65% uh, voted in the 2012 election. 13% show up on these files as a registered voter but did not turn out in 2012. There's another 10% who are on the radar, as it were, on the grid, showing up in these databases, but through their consumer behavior, not because they're a registered voter. And then there's another 11% where we found a human being at an address that exists. It's a real physical place. We went there, or our field workers did. They, they're talking to Jim, and Jim, do you live here? Yes, Jim says he lives here. What's your name? Jim, and we get a name, and we, we m multiple attempts to match Jim and we get a date of birth as well, I should say. We've got, a, you know, we, we've got, this is as good as it's going to get. And we just cannot find this person. Um, sometimes we find people at addresses other than the one that they're being interviewed at. Right? But um, the people we're talking about today are people that are just not, <laughs> aren't showing up. They are kind of off the grid to use some X-Files uh, for the uh, uh, metaphor. Yeah. Okay. And of course, so who are these people? And this paper with Brad, you know, we've written a very short, very descriptive paper. We, 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 this version of the paper is designed for consumption, not so much by scholars necessarily, but by practitioners. We wanted this, this version of the paper to, to, be, to have an impact in, in the industry, because it is an industry uh, in, in the United States, the political mobilization industry. Um, and so we wrote a very descriptive uh, paper, and, and there's sort of a more uh, nerdy version. There's a lot more stats and, and, you know, and, and attention to statistical detail. This is literally just tables and counting people, uh, which is kind of fun in and of itself. Um, so the first thing we did was uh, how does it break by race and ethnicity? And so there's that overall distribution I described. Um, just before, 65, 13, 10, 11, and you can see the way this, this cashes out um, across uh, uh, racial groups. Just 8% of, of whites fall into this unlisted category, but we're talking about a one in five uh, proposition for African Americans and for Hispanics. 20% um, of those populations are just not showing up uh, uh, in, in, um, in, these, in these databases. Other here, is uh, largely mixed race people. It's, it's, uh, we follow uh, US census practices and people are allowed to uh, uh, express or report multiple racial or ethnic um, categories. Um, um, and there's also Asian Americans fall into this 6% group and there's a significant, you know, pretty high rate of, of being unlisted uh, there as well. Um, what's interesting, um, about these big numbers here is that if you sort of X out this row of the table, differences in turnout now across the racial groups start to even out a little bit if you condition on the, on the, on the, on the people that are only listed. So as a proportion of the listed population, this 58% which is of the total of black, that, that, that becomes higher and 
you know, what is on its face is a 13% is a turnout gap between whites and blacks. And, uh, and this is sort of a little surprising. I think it's one of the kind of the myths of the 2012 and the 2008 election in the United States that Obama drove, you know, overwhelmingly high levels of black turnout. Um, well, that's true and, and not true. Uh, and the not true part is that it expresses a proportion of the African American population. Um, black turnout lags white turnout considerably. Um, but if you normalize, if you will, by you know, this 11%, there's an 11% um, difference here that helps account for um, a lot of the, 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 the turnout gap is, is largely due to the fact that um, so much of the black population is just off the grid and essentially invisible to political campaigns that rely on lists uh, as a way of, of contacting people. Um, so it's sort of, a, sort of an interesting um, yeah, oh, the other thing, just again, this is not so much to do with listed and unlisted, but just again, sort of Hispanic turnout, again, these are citizens, um, just the slow incorporation of, um, of Latinos into the American political system, uh, their, their turnout, um, you know, still less than half of the, of the citizen uh, uh, Latino population. Uh, turned out in an election like 2012. And, and so, I mean, again, this is off topic, but this sort of tells you a lot about the future of American politics is as this number starts to approach this number, um, and given the, the Democratic, you know, this, this group is overwhelmingly Democratic, this is sort of a big part of the, the sort of almost a, a more demographic glacial sort of uh, trend in. American society. We can turn that table around and, and, and ask um, now, um, conditional on being in one of these groups, what is the ethnic breakout? And so, so the, the thing to note here is that um, unlisted is basically, it's, a, it's, it's half of it is a minority, uh, it's a non white group. Um, although, right, but overall, right, um, the minority is just way more likely to appear in some listed groups and they are relative to their population uh, proportions. So we're talking about a group that is just less white by a considerable margin than the, than the population at large and certainly the, uh, the voting population. Okay. A few other little basic descriptive things we did was to just, you know, are these people poorer? What's, what's the story? And the answer is yes, they are poorer. Um, the panel on the right here shows, um, this is household income, um, average household income across the four voter types. Average household income for voters is reported you know, to be in the neighborhood of about $75,000. But there's not much difference across these other groups, um, but our enlisted you know, drops down to uh, you know, about $45,000. It's about a, a $30,000 a year. It's a pretty big gap. Right, uh, in, in income, they're the, by, by a little bit the poorest group of the four are, are unlisted. Uh, the unlisted are uh, much more likely to report not having health insurance. Um, so for voters, uh, that's down around about 10% at most. That's uh, up almost to one in three uh, for the unlisted. And, and this one is key, home ownership is, is very closely tied to the phenomenon um, how does one become unlisted or stay unlisted? Home ownership and, and residential stability is a big part of the, kind of the, the phenomenon here. Um, if you live in a house that you own for a while, you're on the grid, right? You are a nice, normatively regular sort of person and you're gonna pop up in these databases one way or another. If you're, if you're itinerant, if you're poor, you're a renter, um, or both of those things, and those things tend to go together. You're moving a lot either by choice or by necessity. Um, you're much more likely uh, to be unlisted. And so the rate of being unlisted, uh, 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 the percent of unlisted people who report owning their own home again is about 40%, and to, you know, about half of the rate among, among voters. Um, unlisted people are um, younger. There's about a 20 year age gap in median age, right? The electorate. Um, the median age of, of voters is 50. The median age of these people that are essentially invisible to current technologies of campaigning is, um, 
is 30. Uh, here's a deeper dive on the residential mobility income story. Um, this one's a little interesting. What we did is we broke it out by income tercile. Um, and then across the, across the axis here, we've got how long you've lived at the current address. And even wealthy people, you know, or people in the wealthiest third of our data set, if, you've only, if you're a recent mover, there's a substantial risk that you're unlisted. Um, right? That can be recent movers, and this is even you know, this is a pretty noisy group. We haven't got a lot of people. We've cut the data pretty fine at this point. Um, but, but, you know, you're seeing reasonably high rates of, uh, remember the, the population incidence is 11%. Um, we're seeing sort of rates in excess of that, even among the wealthy for people that have moved recently. But if you're poor and you haven't lived in, in uh, your address long, you know, the, the, the incidence of being unlisted now is, is, is three times the base rate. And it's up to one in three. So, sort of living this life that is invisible to <laughs> nerves and their computers and that, are, that are powering contemporary um, American political campaigns. Um, unsurprisingly, if you're unlisted, you're going to be much less likely to report campaign contact. So uh, were you contacted by the campaigns? Uh, that's one of the questions we ask on this survey. Um, it's basically zero. <laughs> if you're unlisted, you're, you're just you're not being found um, by, by campaigns. They can't, using the technologies they tend to rely on, uh, lists, they're, they're, they're much less likely to find you. What's amazing is, to us at least, is the rate at which uh, rich people, and this is that we looked at their 2008 vote history, we could get that from the file, right? We could verify, right, once we match people to the file, uh, do, does it appear that they had voted in the previous election? So if you're a voter, right, so now you're sort of, and the campaigns can see this too, there's on the list. So if you're wealthy and you're a voter, they're the people being contacted, they'll report uh, being, being contacted. Um, okay. Why is that? Why if your salary is high, you are more contacted? What's the reason? You might want to give money to the campaign. Might be in a position to give money to the campaigns. So it's not just about them. turning out people to vote, it's about yes. having them turn out their wallets. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also asked uh, do you have a form of government ID, either a passport, a driver's license, or some other form of official photo identification, which is sort of increasingly a big deal in the United States with. Uh, mm -hmm photo ID laws in various parts of the country. And, and we haven't presented this as well as we could, but the point here is that um, and we've, we've tried to also break it by racial groups. But the unlisted, these bars are sitting lower. It's still quite high, um, but, but lower than, than, than voters and, and, and other groups um, on, on average. OK. Um, the really important thing is, how does this cash out politically? So one thing we just tabulated um, the Obama versus Romney. We ask people, irrespective of whether they're a voter, right, on our survey we ask, you know, we, just, we get everybody to answer a vote intention or a vote preference question, irrespective of whether they tell us they're registered or not. We get that of everybody. And then we just compile it all and break out what is the Obama-Romney vote differential across the four groups. Well, among voters, we get a, you know, we get a 52-48 result, which is nice because that's pretty that's the good thing about our survey, we actually got pretty close to the actual election result. Um, but then as you expand the set, now these are registered people, 13% of the population is registered but didn't vote. That group prefers Obama over Romney, that's a 30 point margin. Right. Um, the unregistered, you're on the grid, right? you're showing up in these databases but not as a registered voter, that's, we estimate that to be 10%. Mm -hmm. That's a sizable, right? There's, there's a lot of democratic uh, advantage in that group as well. And then finally, among the unlisted, there's 11% of the electorate, or at least 11% of the electorate. Um, this is overwhelmingly, this group reports favoring Obama over Romney, 75-25, and that shouldn't be surprised by this stage of the presentation, given that I told you they're less white, they're poorer, or, or you know, things that sort of 
historically point towards a democratic leaning constituency, but by a bumping um, amount. This is the party identification breakout too. We asked the, the you know, it's the, the ANES, that's where the party ID item got, got, got started. Um, but in terms of party identification, generally speaking, um, do you think of yourself as Democratic, Republican, or, or something else? Trying to get a sense of partisan identification, not just who you prefer in the current election. Um, you can see that only 15% of the unlisted population uh, identifies as, uh, as Republican versus 28% of voters. This unregistered group is highly sort of apolitical, right? 63% saying other or don't know. Or, right? And similarly, a lot of political, higher rates of political disaffection there um, among registered voters who, who sat out the 2012 um, election. But nonetheless, sort of all of these constituencies sort of pretty, pretty strong evidence that as we sort of grow the pie, as it were, out, um, Picking up, there's a, there's a lot of democratic votes there. But for me, that I mean, as in, you know, this paper is about the unlisted. Uh, we do have this fourfold classification running through the paper. Though this is a very interesting number right there. As impressive as plus 46 with respect to 11% of the population is here. These are registered voters who, who, who didn't turn out, and there's a plus 30 with respect to 13% of the population. And these would have been either, right? They're on the file. These are people that. Not only on the file, they're registered voters that, for, for whatever reason, uh, sat out the 2012 election. Um, and in the end, Obama won, right? So, but, but you know, the Republicans have the Congress. Uh, so, it's sort of, there's, there's still more at stake uh, there. But, so, anyway, that's, that's sort of an interesting wrinkle. Our story is largely about the enlisted in this paper, but we've got these data on these other types as well. So. So what have we learned? Um, the unlisted are poorer, wider, uh, less white, and um, younger than, the, than these other groups uh, in, in the electorate. Um, um, there's a really interesting question as to why. Like, like, why are these people unlisted? Why, why have the political parties failed to, to, to get them on the books? as it were, to, to register them. And I think so much, the, I think the answer is a little complicated, but, but it goes something like, you know, for the most part, you know, these are, un, this is an unreliable constituency. Um, they move a lot. It's hard to keep track of them. Um, 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 it's not clear that they would, would, even though they express democratic sympathies, would they deliver? You know, if you if you went to the trouble of the other thing is, I just think there's this ignorance at work too. I think the whole so much of what's happened in the American you know this industry that didn't exist eight years ago, and it's really the success of the Obama campaign and the embrace of data and analytics that has given birth to this whole sort of way of doing business in the United States. I don't think people. It's hard for people to think in terms of other than the list. So the list is the electorate. You know, they're the people we can reach using, you know, for someone sitting in an air-conditioned office in Palo Alto or Los Angeles or Chicago or Washington. There's this other way of reaching voters, and it's called knocking on doors. Mm -hmm. And it used to be, right, that's what the American, I don't know about you, but that was the folklore I grew up reading about uh, the American party machinery, that they, particularly on the Democratic side, that, that, that there were people like precinct captains and ward captains and they would walk the block and they knew when people moved in and one of the things you would do when a new family arrived is get them on the voter roll and, and all that good old fashioned, again I think it's you know, the, the golden days of your type, you know, almost sort of faded into the mists of time where now political mobilisation is, is not for the most part done that way. It's too expensive. Um, and it's, or it's too, in terms of labour, even with volunteers, just the sheer amount of people you need, you know, or forms of social organisation have changed. The social capital on the ground in those sorts of neighbourhoods where those sorts of people live has just gotten poorer. Social networks are more porous and, and not as not as dense. And so, that form of political mobilisation, one that we grew up being the textbook account of how the American political machines worked, I think is 
it's a thing of the past. And, and today, it's the, the political hero isn't, isn't someone walking the neighborhood with a check with a clipboard, it's someone sitting in an office um, doing data language um, and running uh, uh, machine learning algorithms. Um, I think that's, that's part of it. The other thing is, if, this, if these groups are geographically concentrated, then it's, it's not clear that how does it help Maxine Waters or, a, or a, a, a Democratic incumbent who's already winning 85-15 to say, oh, there's another 8% of vote out there for you. Right? And say, I'm doing fine, thanks. I don't need any, you know, you know, more you know, in these heavily African American poor neighborhoods to sort of run up, you know, to, to turn more. The people that may have an interest in that are the national campaigns, but only if it's Ohio. So not so much in California, the idea of turning out more African Americans it doesn't really, to be perfectly honest about it, it's not clear that, that helps. Uh, and it's diverting resources, and it even hurts because you're diverting resources for that effort away from turning out votes in Cleveland, where you need to win, or, or Florida. So I think there's a, perhaps some of that going on as well. But, but, um, but, but above all, I actually think it's just this focus on the list. So lists have made campaigning more efficient, that's, that's, that's for sure. But there's also a bit of biasing going on. The electorate that we now have in mind, or that is visible through these lists, is certainly, our evidence is pretty clear. It's, it's wider, it's older, it's wealthier, it's slightly more conservative than the real electorate that we discover through good old-fashioned burning of shoe leather and knocking on doors. So I'll, I'll stop there. I, you know, in q and happy to talk about Australian implications, perhaps. I, I you know, talk to people at the Radical Commission or the Parliamentary Library about what the Australian version of, what the Australian version of this phenomenon might look like, but it's certainly more than that.